Part two, the growth, chapter 30. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Theophilus said, baptizing Atreides in the first spring they found. Atreides knelt. Giving the German support, Theophilus leaned him back. Buried in Christ, he said, submerging him, and raised up in the newness of life. He drew him up again. Dripping wet, Atreides stood. Turning, he saw Rizpa standing ankle-deep in the water holding his son, and made another decision that would affect the rest of his life. I claim Rizpa as my wife. Rizpa's gaze lost its dreamy haze. What? You said you love me. The look in his eyes as he slogged through the water toward her sent her pulse racing and made her want to run. She retreated from the spring onto the bank. I love Theophilus, too, as I love Timon and Portia, Bartimaeus, Camilla, Tibelis, and Nason, and— You said you'd never lie to me, Atreida said his eyes pinning her where she stood. I'm not lying! He came out of the water and stopped in front of her, putting his hands out. Give me the boy! Why? Give me my son! She did so with trepidation. Atreides took him, kissed his cheek, and set him on his feet. As he straightened, he smiled slightly. Her stomach dropped and she took a step back. Retreat gained nothing, for he caught hold of her. When he drew her into his arms, she had only enough time to utter a soft gasp before he kissed her. It was a long time before he loosened his embrace, and by then she couldn't think clearly. You love those others, he conceded, equally affected, but not the way you love me. I'm not sure marrying you is a good idea, she said shakily, alarmed by the power of the sensations he aroused in her. For you are for me. Theophilus stood in the spring, laughing. It will be a blessed relief, he strode toward them, grinning. Or have you forgotten God himself but the two of you together in Ephesus? Not as husband and wife, Rizpa said, trying to put some distance between her and Atreides. She needed time to think, and she couldn't with him holding her the way he was. Was it proper to want a man so much? Was it Christian? She looked at Theophilus for help, but he seemed pleased. Atreides had no intention of letting her go until she capitulated. We're mother and father to the same child. It makes sense we'd be man and wife as well. Say yes. When she stammered, he cupped the back of her head. Say yes. One word. Yes. He kissed her again, as soundly as the first time. Theophilus! She gasped when Atreides finally let her take a breath. Say yes, Rizba, Theophilus said, amused. There's one thing you should have learned a long time ago about this man. Once he makes up his mind, it takes an act of God to change it. Atreides held her at arm's length, his expression somber as he searched her face. Why do you hesitate? What brought you to this pass? What brought me? Your death opened my eyes. I need you, not just because of Caleb, but for myself. She couldn't look in his eyes without weakening. Closing them, she prayed wildly, her heart crying out to the Lord. Is this what you want for us, or is that our own flesh yearning? It is not good for man to be alone. The words came so softly to mind, she thought someone had whispered them. She felt Atreides' fingertips touching her throat tenderly and shivered. Opening her eyes... She looked into his and saw a softness and vulnerability she had never guessed existed. It wasn't just desire that drove him to this decision. He loved her, truly loved her. Lord God, don't let me be a stumbling block. Don't let him be one. Help me light his way. You know how my tongue gets away with me. Again, the soft whisper came. Trust in me with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. She took his hand. Not for Caleb only, Atreides, but for myself. I will marry you, she said. Tears filled her eyes when she saw joy leap into his. Did she really matter so much to him? She had never thought it possible for this hard, violent man to have such tender feelings and deep needs. More the fool I, Lord, will I ever see him through your eyes and with your heart? Theophilus came out of the spring and walked toward them. When he reached them, he held out his hands to them both. Atreides took his right, Rizpa his left. Lord God, we stand before you this day to join Atreides and Rizpa in marriage. Be with us, Jesus, in the making of these bonds. He looked at Atreides. In a Christian marriage, Atreides, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so you will be subject to Christ, and so also Rizba will be subject to you in everything. Love her, just as Christ also loves you and gave himself up for you, sacrificially, willing even to die for her. Love her as you love your own body. Sustain and protect her in all circumstances. I will. Theophilus looked at Rizpa and smiled. Be subject to Atreides, beloved. Be subject to him as to the Lord, and respect him as your husband. 
I will. Caleb stood in the middle of their small circle, looking up at them as Theophilus brought his mother's and father's hands together over the child's head. Atreides clasped Rizpah's hand possessively. Theophilus put one hand over theirs and another beneath. Be subject to one another in fear of Christ. There is neither male nor female, for you are one in Christ Jesus, called to live according to God's will and not your own. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us and arose on the third day. Our God is patient and kind. He is never jealous, nor boasts, nor is arrogant. Jesus never sought his own, nor was provoked, nor took into account a wrong suffered. The Lord never rejoices in unrighteousness. Christ Jesus bore all things and endured all things for our sake. His love never fails. Therefore, beloved, remember and follow in his way. Walk as children of light. Cleave to one another. Submit to one another in the love of Christ, and live in a way pleasing to Jesus Christ our Lord. Releasing their hands, he asked them to kneel before God, then did so with them. Quiet and wide-eyed, Caleb hugged Rizpah's side as Theophilus laid one hand upon her head, the other on Atreides. Lord God, creator of all things, creator of this man and woman, I ask your blessing upon them as they go forth as man and wife. Please, Lord, Rizpah said softly, head bowed. May they raise up their son Caleb to praise your name. We will do so, Atreides vowed. Put angels around them and protect them from the enemy who will come against them and try to drive them apart. Please protect us, Lord, Rizpah murmured. Give them children to raise up in your name. Sons and daughters, Atreides said boldly, and heat filled Rizpah's face and body. Theophilus grinned and then went on. Lord Jesus, may Atreides and Rizpah serve you with gladness and come into your presence daily with thanksgiving knowing you alone are God. You have made them in your image and have a divine purpose for their lives. You are their shield and their strength. May they never lean on their own understanding, Lord, but trust in you, acknowledging you in all their ways, so that you will make their path straight. May we please you, Lord, Rispa said. Lord Jesus, Theophilus said, and whatever circumstances may arise, may your infinite grace and mercy be extended to others through each of them. Amen. Amen, Atreides said and stood drawing Rizba up beside him. His blue eyes were alight, and he was shaking. Heat poured into her cheeks. She was afraid he was going to haul her into his arms and start kissing her right in front of Theophilus again. Instead, he lowered his head to kiss both of her hands, then released her. You should wash the blood out of your tunic, he said, and hunkered down before his son. Come on, boy, you need a bath. Lifting him, he stood and tossed the child high into the air. Caleb squealed with thrilled laughter. Atreides caught him and ran into the spring, while Rizba stared, dumbfounded, after him. Disappointment and relief roared within her. She would never understand the man. Never. Tell Atreides I'll make camp and keep watch, Theophilus said, as he hefted the men's gear onto his back. She glanced at him, embarrassed that she had forgotten his presence. He grinned wryly. It's been quite a day. Thank you, she said, quick tears of gratitude filling her eyes. She flung her arms around his neck and kissed his cheek. Thank you for praying for me, she said hoarsely, unable to stay more. Dropping his burdens, he held her briefly. I've been praying for both of you for a long, long time. As she settled before him, he patted her cheek as he would that of a daughter. Your husband gave you a command to wash your tunic. And I will obey, she said, eyes shining. She took one of his hands in both of hers. I love you, Theophilus, and thank God you're my brother. What would have happened? Her voice trailed off. Go, beloved. Your husband is waiting. Blinking back tears, she smiled and turned away. Theophilus shouldered the provisions and watched her walk down to the spring where Atreides played with Caleb. She waded in, and Atreides came to meet her. Bending down, he kissed her. As he watched, Theophilus felt an inexplicable loneliness. There were times when his solitary life chafed, like now, when he felt cut off from Rizpa and Atreides because of the holy bond that would change their relationship to one of intimacy. He had watched these two burn for one another from Ephesus to Germania, and prayed they wouldn't be drawn into sin. God knew their natures and their needs. He had given them their desires and made provision for them. They were married. For himself, soldiers weren't allowed to take wives. The restriction had rubbed on occasion. Before he had been saved by Jesus, he had burned and given in to sin. Women had been a primary pleasure in his life. All that had changed when he had become a Christian. Now that he was retired from the army, life would be different. He could take a wife, but he didn't think it was in God's plan for him. The desire to do so had actually diminished. Twenty-five of his forty years had been spent fighting battles and building roads. 
From Rome to Germania to, I to Ionia, he had few years left upon this earth. Those he did have, he wanted to dedicate to the Lord. But there were times. Atreides set his son upon his shoulders and bent to kiss Rizpa again. Theophilus watched and felt a swift and unexpected pang of envy. She was a remarkable young woman. It was clear from her response that they would have little difficulty adjusting to one another. Atreides' life had been hard and bleak till now, but God would give him joy through her. Lord, bless them with a quiver full of children, he said. Turning away, Theophilus walked up the hill to lay the camp and prepare a meal. Hours later, Theophilus saw Atreides and Rizpa walking between the scented spruce and fir toward him. Caleb was sleeping against Rizpa's shoulder. Atreides' arm was about her waist. Theophilus had never seen them so relaxed with one another, and knew God had blessed their afternoon together. When Rizpa looked up at Atreides and said something to him, he stopped and touched her hair lightly. She lifted her chin, and he kissed her, his hand gliding from her shoulder down her arm in a tender and natural gesture of possession. Theophilus looked away, sorry to have intruded on such a private moment. They approached the fire almost reluctantly. He glanced up and smiled in greeting. Help yourself to the rabbits. He knew Rizpa would be self-conscious and tried to put them both at ease. There's plenty of beans stew in the pot and berries in that small basin. Atreides removed his arm from around her shoulders and took his son. Theophilus looked at her and saw her color rise. Atreides put Caleb down amidst the packs and covered him with a blanket. Sit, he said when he saw Rizpa still standing at the edge of the firelight. As she came forward, Atreides glanced at Theophilus. He gestured for him to eat. Squatting down, Atreides removed one of the three roasted rabbits from the spit and put it on a wooden plate. He spooned bean, lentil, and corn mush beside it. Set over hair, he said to Rizpa, and when she obeyed, he handed it to her. He brushed her cheek lightly and then served himself. When she bowed her head to pray, Atreides watched her and waited until she finished. Atreides was as ravenous for food as he had been for Rizpa all afternoon. He ate quickly, tossing bones into the fire. He finished the rabbit before Rizpa was half finished with hers. You can have the other one on the spit, Atreides, Theophilus told him, amused. He had never seen Atreides so hungry. I've already eaten. Atreides raised his brow at Rizpa. She nodded. There's plenty here for me and Caleb when he awakens. I'll hunt tomorrow, Atreides told Theophilus as he slid the last roasted rabbit from the branched spit. There are plenty of deer. Theophilus laughed, despite his resolve not to do so. It would seem married life demanded added nourishment, but he curbed the temptation to remark on it. Atreides might appreciate manly humor, but Rizpa would be even more embarrassed. He leaned back, making himself comfortable against his pack. I thought you were in a hurry to find your people. We wait, Atreides said decisively, and flung a leg bone into the fire. We stay here until you tell me everything you know about Jesus Christ. Theophilus could not have been more pleased by Atreides' demand, but he was a soldier and bent to the practical. What about the Mariachi? We're on high ground, Atreides said, not the least concerned. They attacked once. They could attack again. They attack an enemy in a low clearing like the one we were in today. You wounded two. I killed four. They won't come looking for us. He tossed the last of the bones into the fire. The Mariachi are cowards. Atreides dismissed further discussion of tribal disputes with a return to his earlier demand. Tell me about Jesus. Hadassah told me of his crucifixion and resurrection. I thought he was weak. Now I know better. He is a true God, but I have questions. You say God is Jesus, yet you say Jesus is God. Explain. Jesus is God, Atreides. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who dwells within you now, are all one. How is that possible? Some things are too wonderful for man to understand, Theophilus said, spreading his hands and wishing Atreides had asked an easier question. I'm a simple soldier for Christ, and as clear an understanding as I have is that there is God the Father, awesome and unreachable because sin came into the world. And then there is Jesus Christ, God the Son, sent to atone for sin and remove the veil from the Holy of Holies, so that we can go before the Almighty and have an intimate relationship with Him as Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. He saw a frown flicker across the traitor's face, but plunged ahead. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us when we believe in Christ and are redeemed. It is through the Spirit that God reveals mysteries to us, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. And I have the Spirit living inside me now. The moment you accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit came to dwell within you. Then I am possessed by the Spirit. Possessed is not a word I'd use to describe it. 
The Holy Spirit abides in you at your invitation and acts as your helper. I didn't invite it in. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, I believe he is a living God. And you accept that he is your Savior and Lord? He is my God. I have sworn it. Then know that Jesus has also given you the Holy Spirit. He told his disciples after his resurrection and before his ascension to the Father that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He said they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. You are a partaker of the promise because you believe. When Atreides asked who the disciples were, Theophilus told him, Perhaps they were more than men also, Atreides said. They were ordinary men. Several were fishermen, one a tax collector, another an insurrectionist like you. There is nothing special about any of them, except that Jesus chose them to be his followers. God chooses the ordinary and makes them extraordinary. Theophilus saw Atreides' confusion and felt insufficient for the task of answering and discussing spiritual questions. The German's troubled frown was clear indication he was baffling rather than enlightening him. God help me, give me your words. I'm a simple man, Atreides, with simple thoughts and simple faith. Atreides leaned forward, determined to understand. Who are Adam and Eve, and where is this Garden of Eden of which you spoke? Theophilus felt relief. Ask in my name, and it will be granted you. The answer had come. Start at the beginning. He laughed softly, rejoicing. God answers. Let the scriptures be known. Let me tell you the whole story, not just the finish. His face shone in the firelight, angelic and carved in strength, holding Atreides full attention. Rizpah listened as Theophilus told the story of the creation of the heavens and the earth, and all that was on the earth, including man. Like music, the Roman's deep voice drove back the sounds of enveloping darkness, making her aware of the stars in the heavens and the hope of God. And then man was created in the image of God and woman was fashioned from his rib to be his companion and helper. Rizpah marveled anew. God spoke, and all things came into being. The word was the very breath of life in the beginning, as it would be to the end of time. Theophilus told of Satan, God's most beautiful creation, an ancient of ancients who was cast out of heaven because of pride, who entered the garden in the form of a serpent and tempted Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge with the promise that she would become like God. Deceived, she ate while her husband stood silent beside her, and sin was conceived and born. Eve gave of the fruit to her husband, who also ate, and because of their disobedience, God cast them out of the garden. They would no longer live forever, nor be in the presence of the Lord, but would live out a lifespan of years and struggle for existence. And thus, death, the consequence of sin, came into being. Adam and Eve bore sons who carried the seed of sin within them. Sin took root and grew in the jealousy of Cain, who murdered his brother, Abel. As men multiplied upon the earth, their wickedness increased until every intent of man was evil. The Lord was sorry he had made man and decided to blot him out as well as the animals and all creeping things he had created, Theophilus said. Only one creature found favor in God's sight, a man named Noah. Atreides sat enthralled, absorbing every word and feeling faint stirrings within him as though some deep part of him that had slumbered was now awakening. He listened as raptly as a child to the story of Noah building the ark, of the animals entering into it two by two, male and female, and then of the rains coming to flood the earth and destroy all life upon it. Every living thing died except those in the ark, and then God allowed the waters to recede and set the ark upon a mountain where he made a covenant with Noah. God said he would never destroy man by flood again, and sent a rainbow in the sky as a sign of his promise. And so Noah and his wife, and his sons and their wives, left the ark and began to populate the earth again. Caleb awakened hungry, and Rizpah rose to sit with him and feed him the nourishing gruel with bits of rabbit meat mixed into it. Theophilus went on. Now the whole earth used one language, and people gathered together to build for themselves a tower of brick and mortar to reach heaven. Seeing what they were doing, God confused their language and scattered them abroad from there across the face of the earth. Thousands of years passed before God spoke to man again. Then he came to one man, Abram, whom he told to leave his country of Ur and his relatives and his father's house and go to the land he would show him. God promised to make of Abram a great nation through which all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Theophilus prodded the fire, spreading the glowing coals and adding more thick branches as he spoke. Abram did go forth as God told him, for he believed God, but he took with him Sarai, his half-sister who was his wife. Lot, an ambitious nephew, and Terah, his father. He also took with him all of his possessions, 
including the slaves he had acquired. When he reached the land God showed him, a dispute broke out between him and Lot, and he gave his nephew the choice of land. Abram settled in the land, and Lot settled in one of the cities of the valley and lived in Sodom. God told Abram again that he would make of him a nation, great in numbers. Abram believed God, even knowing that his wife, Sarai, was barren. Sarai believed for a time, but lost patience and took it upon herself to convince Abram that he should beget a child with her Egyptian handmaiden, Hagar. Abram did as she suggested, and Hagar bore a son, Ishmael. Trouble came immediately. Hagar became proud, Sarai jealous. When Abram was ninety-six, the Lord came to him and made a covenant with him. God changed Abram's name to Abraham, which means the father of nations. The sign of this covenant was circumcision. Every male eight days old was to be circumcised. Abraham, Ishmael, and all the boys and men in his tribe were circumcised in obedience to this covenant. As for Sarai, God said that she would bear Abraham a son in their old age, and that they would call him Isaac, meaning laughter. A cool breeze rustled the trees as Theophilus went on telling of the animosity between the women and their sons. Atreides nodded in agreement as he heard how Hagar and Ishmael were cast out, for it was through Isaac that the promised nation would come forth. God tested Abraham, for he told him to make of Isaac a burnt offering. Abraham rose early, took his son and wood, and went to the place the Lord had told him to go. There he built an altar, arranged the wood, and bound his son, and laid him upon it. But when he took the knife to slay him, an angel of the Lord told him to stay his hand. Abraham believed, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. God provided a ram for sacrifice and renewed his covenant with Abraham, telling him yet again that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Theophilus leaned forward, face glowing. For it was through Abraham that a people of faith came into being, and from them God promised all mankind the Messiah, the Anointed One who would overcome the sin in the Garden of Eden and give those who believe in him eternal life. He smiled. But I'm jumping ahead. Retracing, he told the traders how Isaac married Rebekah, who bore him twin sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau, the elder, sold his birthright to his younger brother for a bowl of food, and Jacob later stole his brother's blessing by trickery and deceit. Enmity arose between the two brothers, and Jacob fled to Laban, his mother's brother. He fell in love with Laban's younger daughter, Rachel. Through Laban's trickery and deceit, Jacob married Leah and then Rachel and was bound to his uncle for more than fourteen years. From these two women and their two handmaidens, Jacob fathered twelve sons. The favorite son was Joseph, son of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel. Joseph was a dreamer of dreams and prophesied a time when he would rule over his brothers and his own father. His brothers despised him and in their jealousy plotted against him. They threw him into a cistern and sold him to a traveling caravan that took him to Egypt where he became a slave of Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of the pharaoh. Joseph was a handsome young man, and Potiphar's wife wanted him for her lover, but Joseph refused. When she tried to seduce him, he ran away. Scorned and angry, she told her husband that Joseph had tried to rape her, so Potiphar cast Joseph into the dungeon. Atreides gave a cynical laugh. Women have been causing trouble for men from the beginning, he said, stretching out on his side. Rispa glanced up from where she was changing Caleb's linens. That's true, she said, smiling. When men are weak and give in to passion rather than obedience to the Lord, they usually do run into trouble head on. Atreides ignored her observation and raised his brow at Theophilus. Suppressing a smile, Theophilus continued, telling of Joseph's God-given ability to interpret dreams and how this gift brought him into the palace of Pharaoh and made him second in power in all of Egypt. When the prophesied famine came, Joseph's brothers journeyed to Egypt for grain, thus fulfilling the prophecies of his youth that he would rule over them as well as his father. Joseph forgave them, telling them that what they had done for evil, God had turned to good. Rispa settled Caleb in a nest of packs and blankets and came back to sit near Atreides. Another pharaoh rose who didn't know of Joseph's deeds. He saw a threat in the increasing number of Joseph's descendants and made them slaves. When their number continued to grow, pharaoh became alarmed and commanded that all male newborns were to be killed. Moses, a descendant of Abraham, was born and placed in a basket and hidden among the reeds of the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter found him and raised him as her own son. When he grew to manhood, he went to his brethren and looked upon their hard labors. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and struck him down. When word spread among the Hebrews of what he had done, he fled to Midian. There, after years in exile, God spoke to Moses from a burning bush. 
Theophilus smiled slightly. Now, Moses was an ordinary man and terrified that God was speaking to him. When God told him he wanted him to return to Egypt and lead the Hebrew slaves out of bondage, Moses was more afraid of the mission than of God himself. He pleaded, saying he was nobody. God said he would be his spokesman. Moses said he didn't know God's name and that the Hebrews wouldn't believe him. God told him to say that I am had sent him. Moses still resisted, insisting they wouldn't believe him. God told him to throw his staff on the ground, and when he obeyed, the Lord turned it into a serpent. Moses ran from it, terrified, but God called him back and told him to take hold of the tail. When he obeyed, the serpent became a staff once more. Still, Moses was afraid, insisting he had never been eloquent, that he was slow of speech and slow of tongue. God said that he would teach him what to say, but Moses asked him to send someone else. A traitor snorted. God should have struck him dead. God is patient with us, Rizba said, smiling. Indeed, Theophilus agreed, and we are grateful. God said that Moses' brother, Aaron, was well-spoken, and that God would give the words to Moses, and Moses would give them to Aaron, who would speak them to Pharaoh. He also said that he would harden Pharaoh's heart, and signs and wonders would be performed before the Hebrews as well as the Egyptians. Why would God choose such a coward to lead his people? Atreides said, disgusted. Theophilus laughed. I wondered that myself when I first heard the story. But had Moses been a mighty warrior, vastly intelligent, and with the charisma of an orator, who do you suppose would have received glory for what was to come? Moses. Exactly. God chooses the foolish and weak things of the world to shame the wise and the strong, to show his power and our weakness without him. God's power is perfect in our weakness, for it's only through his strength we accomplish anything of value. Theophilus went on, telling of Moses and Aaron going before Pharaoh and demanding that he let God's people go. Pharaoh refused. When Moses dropped his staff upon the floor and it became a snake, Pharaoh's magicians used their secret arts to make their staffs become snakes also. But Moses' snake swallowed the magician's snakes. When Pharaoh still refused to let the Hebrew slaves go, Moses touched the Nile River with his staff and the water became blood. Still Pharaoh refused. The Lord brought plague after plague upon Egypt. Frogs, gnats, swarms of insects, pestilence on Egyptian livestock, boils, thunder and hail, locusts, and darkness. During each plague, Pharaoh relented. Then, when the crisis passed, hardened his heart once again. Atreides sat up. The man was a fool! The man was proud, Theophilus said. Proud men are often foolish. Nine plagues! Frogs, gnats, boils... What does it take for him to bow down before God? How many plagues have you suffered in your life, Atreides? Defeat, slavery, beatings, humiliation, degradation, betrayal. What did it take for you to bow down before God and accept the truth that he is sovereign majesty of all creation? Atreides' eyes narrowed coldly, his face hardening. Theophilus saw and wondered if he had spoken too freely, offending rather than teaching. He retracted nothing, nor softened it. Rather, he waited, leaving the choice to Atreides as he had done so often before. Atreides thought of Julia. He thought of the hundreds of things that had happened to him from the time he was a young man fighting for his people. He remembered all he had experienced as a grown man fighting to stay alive in the arenas of Rome and Ephesus. Through it all, Tiwaz had remained silent and uncaring. And still it was this God's name he had cried out, not that of Jesus, even after he had been told the gospel by Hadassah. You speak the truth, he said. I was as much a fool as the Egyptian pharaoh. God is already at work in you, Atreides, Theophilus said, warming to the barbarian. Atreides gave a bleak laugh, feeling no vital change within him, only a burning curiosity to hear everything about God. Go on. It was more a command than a request, as humble a capitulation as he would allow himself. God told Moses that he would send the angel of death upon Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land would die. From the child of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the children of the slaves in the kingdom, down to the young of the cattle in the field. Revenge, retribution, and hope. He told Moses that Pharaoh would not listen to him, so that his wonders would be multiplied in the land. God also told Moses what to tell the people to do to have the death pass over them. Moses gathered the Hebrews and told them that each household was to take a male lamb, unblemished and one-year-old, and kill it at twilight. The blood of the lamb was to be put on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they ate. When God saw the blood of the Lamb, he would pass over, and no plague would befall them when he struck the land of Egypt with death. The meal prepared from the Lamb was, and still is, 
called Passover. Theophilus spread his hands. As God did 1,500 years ago for the Hebrew slaves held in cruel bondage, God did again for all of us through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus is our Passover lamb, Atreides. When Christ shed his blood for us upon the cross, he broke the chains of sin and death and gave us eternal life. Atreides felt his flesh tingle at Theophilus' words. Why didn't Jesus come then, instead of waiting so long? I don't know, Theophilus said frankly. I'll never have all the answers I want. If I did, I could put God into a wineskin or an amphora. And then what sort of God would he be, except one smaller than my own limited mind? God chooses the perfect time. Over and over in scripture, we see how God teaches and tests man. From creation to this moment, God offers salvation to any who wish it. A gift by grace, not something we earn. Or appreciate, Rizpa said quietly. It struck me as you spoke, Theophilus. Jesus left his heavenly throne, his glory and honor, took the form of humble man. He suffered and died. For me, she put her hand over her heart. And what do I do? More often than not, I take my salvation for granted. I fill my mind with unimportant things, such as how long it'll take to reach a traitor's people and what they'll think of me when we get there. Her eyes grew moist. Oh, that God would put in my head and heart what he has done for me every morning as I awaken. So be it, Theophilus said, his voice gruff with emotion. How many times had he found himself caught up in plans for serving the Lord in the future, rather than praising him now? Too often, of late, they had arisen early, said a perfunctory prayer, and hastened on. It had taken Madachi warriors and Rizpa's death to slow them down. Atreides brushed Rizpa's cheek, drawing her attention. We will praise God first day every morning. She put her hand over his, her eyes shining with so much love that he felt the warmth of it spread through his entire body. He wanted her close against him and moved so that he was sitting behind her, legs drawn up on either side. He put one arm across her. She snuggled closer to him, her head back against his shoulder. Theophilus continued his story. The plague came at midnight, and not one household in Egypt was left untouched by death. Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and told them to get out, to go and worship God, and take their flocks with them. The Egyptians urged them to hurry, afraid all would die if the Hebrews didn't go. They even gave them gifts of silver and gold as well. Six hundred thousand men on foot, aside from women and children, followed Moses from Ramses to Sukkoth, and the mixed multitude went with them, along with flocks and herds and livestock. Egyptians? Yes, anyone who believes is God's child, Rizba answered. Theophilus smiled at her, then went on. God told Moses that if any foreigner sojourned with them and was circumcised, they were to be treated as a native for they had become part of the covenant. And God went before them, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, to give them light. For Pharaoh was hardened again and pursued them. When they came to the Red Sea, the people were terrified. Moses cried out to them, The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. But God told him to go forth and stretch out his staff over the sea. And when he did so, the ocean divided. The Hebrews crossed over on dry land, and the pillar of cloud moved behind them. Pharaoh and his army tried to follow, but the moment the last Hebrew stepped on dry land, the water descended, destroying the Egyptians and their horses and chariots, thus giving glory to God in all of Egypt. Theophilus told of how the people grumbled as they traveled, and God gave them manna from heaven to eat, and quail by the thousands when they complained about the manna. God was angered by the people, but Moses pleaded for them. Moses went up onto Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. Atreides listened intently as Theophilus listed each and then went on to tell of the establishing of law, the Sabbaths, the feasts, and the first fruit offerings. He told of the making of the Ark of the Covenant, in which was placed the testimony of God and a portion of manna, as well as Aaron's staff that budded. Below the mountain, the people sinned mightily and made graven images of the gods they worshipped in Egypt. He told of the grumbling, of God's patience and provision, and also of his justice in punishing the people. Still, there was rebellion. Aaron and Miriam spoke against their brother, Moses, questioning his right to leadership. God made Miriam leprous, healing her when Moses cried out to God on her behalf. When they reached the promised land, still the people didn't change. Twelve spies were sent into the land, ten reporting the people who inhabited it were giants and too strong to conquer. Only Joshua and Caleb said they should obey the Lord and go up and take possession of the land. Caleb, a trader said, smiling. A good name. Even Moses, who spoke face to face with the Lord, took the counsel of the ten who were afraid. Rebellion arose, led by Korah, while others, 
unconsecrated, were burning incense. God swallowed up many in the earth and sent fire to consume others. Because the people refused to believe and trust God, he made them wander for forty years in the wilderness. When all of the unbelieving generation had died, Moses spoke to the people. He gave the people the law again and went up on the mountain, where he died. Joshua and Caleb, who believed God wholeheartedly, led the sons and daughters of the old generation into the promised land. He prodded the fire, adding more fuel. God divided the Jordan River as he had the Red Sea, and the Hebrews crossed over with the Ark of the Covenant. Through God's counsel, Joshua and the Israelites brought down the walls of Jericho and overran the city. From there, they conquered many cities, dividing the land, south to north, and then settled in it. The land was divided up among the twelve tribes, and for four hundred years God spoke to the people through judges. He granted it, Redis. One of them you would understand very well, for you share similar weaknesses. His name was Samson, but I'll save his story for another time. He tossed another branch on the fire. All during this time, everyone did that which was right in his own eyes, except Ruth, a Moabitess, and Samuel, who was promised to God before his birth. The kingdom was united for 120 years, and then the people told Samuel they wanted a king like the nations around them. The people rejected God and insisted they be like everyone else. God told Samuel to give them what they wanted, so Samuel anointed Saul, a tall, handsome, and well-formed young man who had no heart for God. Saul was proud and jealous, as well as something of a coward. As the kingdom faltered under his rule, God told Samuel to anoint another, a humble, young shepherd named David. David was a man after God's own heart. As a boy, he killed Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, with a sling and a stone. The people loved him. That was reason enough for Saul to want him dead. Every attempt he made to kill David was met with failure. Even his own son, Jonathan, loved and protected David. When Saul was killed in battle and Jonathan with him, David became king. He was a valiant warrior and the leader of a group called the Mighty Men. Their feats in battle are nothing short of miraculous. David secured the nation, but he fell into sin with the wife of one of his friends. Because of it, his family and kingdom were plagued with trouble from then on. Even his children were beyond control. They committed rape, murder, even rebelled against him to try and take the throne. David's one great dream was to build a temple for the Lord, but God denied him the privilege because he had blood on his hands. His son, Solomon, who reigned during a time of peace, had that privilege. When Solomon became king, he asked God to give him wisdom to rule the people. Because of his humility, God gave him not only wisdom, but great wealth as well. Solomon is reputed to be the wisest and richest king who ever lived, in any kingdom. But even Solomon, in all his earthly glory, proved foolish and half-hearted toward God. He married women from the very nations God had told the Israelites to destroy, the Edomites, Hittites, Amorites, Egyptians. They set up their own altars and pulled him away from the Lord. He didn't repent until he was an old man, and by then it was too late. The kingdom fell to his son Rehoboam. He refused the wisdom of the elder counselors of his father in favor of spoiled friends who had been raised in the palace. The people turned away, and the nation was divided by civil war, Israel to the north, Judah to the south. There were nineteen kings of Israel, and not one had a heart for the Lord. There were twenty kings in Judah, and only eight sought God. Atreides was amazed. After all God had done for them, they still turned away. And still God loved them. Why? Because God's love never changes. He's faithful and trustworthy. God doesn't think like a man, it is. The Israelites were still his children, disobedient and proud, but still his, as they are today, just as we all are by the fact of his creation. He set the Jews apart so that the rest of the nations might see God working through them, but his chosen people wanted to be like the rest of the kingdoms. God sent prophets to speak for him, warning them to repent or be judged, but they scorned and murdered every one of them. He should have destroyed them. We all deserve destruction, don't we? And some of us are destroyed on occasion. God used Assyria to scatter Israel, and Babylon took Judah into exile. The exile lasted seventy years, long enough for an unbelieving generation to die. And then God worked upon the heart of the Persian king, who allowed Zebrabel to return to Israel with a remnant of believers to begin rebuilding the temple. Esther became queen of Persia and saved the Jews from annihilation. Ezra and Nehemiah restored the temple, rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, and celebrated Passover. So the Hebrews returned to God. For a time, it's well to remember one thing, one thread that moves through the entire narrative of the scriptures. God's love never changes, and his will prevails. 
There have always been and always will be those who love the Lord wholeheartedly. Through slavery, hardship, famines, war, exile, persecution. His people. You and Rizba and I. God salts the earth with the faithful because those who cling to the Lord in faith through all circumstances preserve the rest from complete destruction. However, to my knowledge, the last scriptures were written 400 or more years before our Lord came to walk among us, and the prophet Malachi was appealing to God's people to repent again. The scripture says they have hearts of stone. And so, this time, God sent his own son to call them back again. Yes, Jesus shed his blood for us during Passover. Ah, the traitor said, feeling as though his mind had filled with light. And death passes over those who believe and obey him. And for everyone who has the eyes to see and ears to hear, the barriers between man and God were removed for all time. The way is open to the Lord through Jesus Christ. Any man, woman, or child who seeks the Lord with heart, mind, and soul will find him. Atreides was filled with excitement. My people will understand this. It is not far removed from our own religion. One man sacrificed for the many. Such rites have been performed in the sacred grove for centuries. Rizba was chilled by his unexpected and appalling words. Theophilus said nothing. She looked up at him in horror and saw he wasn't the least surprised. Perhaps he had always known. Let's hope they not only understand Atreides, but that they embrace salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord as well.